Welcome back. Chinese President Xi Jinping has returned to the international diplomatic arena in person with his arrival on Wednesday in Kazakhstan. Now, this marks his first foreign trip since the start of the pandemic, and today, that is Thursday, he's poised to meet with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in Uzbekistan on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. For more, I have Professor Chu Jiu from Kyung University. Professor, welcome back. Uh, thank you. I also have Jeff Moon, the head of Moon, China Moon Strategies, that is, a consulting firm that Mr. Moon himself founded after serving as assistant U.S. trade representative for China affairs under the Obama administration. Mr. Moon, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Right. Professor yes. Chu, we'll start here in the studio. Mm. Mr. Xi Jinping, as I mentioned, landed in Kazakhstan's capital of Nur Sultan on Wednesday mm. for talks with his counterpart, Kasim Jurmat Tokayev. Mm. Let's begin with a few words yes. on the significance of Kazakhstan mm. as the destination of his first foreign trip since the start of the pandemic. Yes, it's been a while for Xi Jinping to travel abroad, and it was surprising that he, he decided to travel to uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan is uh, really strategically important to China. It's uh, one of the critical gateways uh, to China's outreach to the world, especially in the region of the uh, in Indian Ocean, South Asia, Central Asia, and so forth. And Kazakhstan is one of the countries that, you know, China shares a, one of the longest border lines. And it's, I, I believe it is the second after, you know, Russia. And uh, uh, it is a really critical gateway uh, to, to Central Asia and Caspian Seas and in terms of geoeconomic strategy perspective. And it is a gateway that extends its uh, uh, oil pipelines to these regions. And um, geopolitically speaking, also, uh, you, we all know that, you know, uh, Kazakhstan is adjacent to uh, China's Xinjiang province, uh, which is pre predominantly, you know, uh, by uh, it, whose, whose population is predominant by uh, uh, Muslim there. And it, it, is, it is a Muslim region there. And so China is really sensitive about the infiltration of the you know, Muslim coming from Central Asia and the Middle East and so forth, especially with uh, fundamental, fundamentalist Muslim activities uh, penetrating into Xinjiang area and causing uh, instability there. So, you know, China is really, uh, it, it keeps a close eyes on ties with Kazakhstan for, for, that, for, for these reasons. Right. Yeah. And Mr. Moon, the, I believe the Belt and Road Initiative was unveiled in Kazakhstan in the year 2013. That being said, what are the prospects of this particular initiative amid the current climate of geopolitical events, if I may? Well, China announced the Belt and Road Initiative both to expand its global economic reach and influence and also to export China's economic overcapacity to other nations. So the initiative has achieved some successes in creating a China, Chinese finance global infrastructure and uh, transportation trade and production networks. Unfortunately, however, the program has also financed many projects that were not viable and loans were extended to underdeveloped countries like Sri Lanka, Laos, and Kenya that cannot repay. So that lending activity has reduced considerably in recent years, both because it was unsustainable and because it's unpopular in China, where citizens think the money should go to something else. So I expect this initiative to continue, but with a less ambitious agenda. I also wonder, frankly, given China's current real estate crisis, how long China can continue funding these unprofitable overseas projects when it desperately needs funds to keep its own real estate sector afloat. Right. Point mm. well taken there. Professor Chu, yes. later today, that is mm. Thursday, as I mentioned at the start, Mr. Mm. Xi Jinping will sit down with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir right. Putin, on the sidelines of the Shanghai um, Cooperation Organization mm. Summit. That is, what do you suppose will be on the agenda of this particular summit? We've mm. reported earlier on that Kremlin has said they'll address the war in Ukraine. What are your thoughts? Yes, I think uh, that could be one new aspect uh, to this uh, summit you know, agenda for this summit. Uh, there could be a whole lot of things. Uh, if we can take the, you know, past results of the bilateral summit, then, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's just, it, it gets as, ex, as extensive and expansive as you can imagine. It covers a broad range and a whole lot of issues uh, that are concerned to the, you know, mutual interest of the two countries. It ranges from economic to security to social welfare and, you know, uh, the people-to-people the -people exchange and everything. Uh, basically, it covers everything. It's, it's really expensive. And there are a number of pages from, uh, for, for the joint summit the statement, too. And, but like, uh, like you pointed out, I think uh, the situation in Ukraine and, and, 
and Russia's stance and probably China's support could be also included, and that, that could be uh, one new aspect that could be included in the joint statement coming out soon. Uh, right, yeah. but we'll have to probably wait and see for That's sure. That's right. Mr. Mm. Moon, the summit between these two leaders, as I mentioned, takes place on the sidelines of the two-day Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. Could you tell us a bit about this particular summit? I mean, its purpose and perhaps its member states. Sure. Well, the SCO was founded in 1996. Its headquarters is in Beijing, and it has a security focus. The original members were China, Russia, and a few Central Asian nations. It's been expanded. Iran, India, Pakistan, Mongolia joined around 2005 as observers. The U.S. applied to be an observer and was not admitted. Um, more recently, Belarus, Turkey, Sri Lanka, and a few other countries have joined as dialogue partners. Uh, China's original interest in this organization was to join forces to combat uprisings in Xinjiang. So there is a permanent terrorism committee. The SCO members are, are sympathetic to authoritarianism, so they can be counted on to support China's activities in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, which are somewhat controversial. They also share China's opposition to Western governments, policies and alliances. Uh, during the past decade, they've held some joint military exercises. They've also had some economic and cultural programs. Um, so China, ironically, strongly supports the SCO and other alliances that it leads, but it claims that alliances that it does not lead are hegemonistic and a danger to its neighbors, including alliances between the Republic and Korea, of Korea and the United States, for example. Right, I see. Meanwhile, Professor yes. Chu, China's top legislator, Li Jiangshu, is leading a delegation here in South Korea. Now, before we touch upon his agenda mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. could you tell us a bit about him? Yes, uh, he's a, he's a well-known figure in Chinese politics. Uh, uh, he's uh, obviously uh, uh, chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, which is uh, equivalent to Korea's National Assembly. And uh, in America, he could be dubbed as a you know, Chinese speaker. And in the power ranking of the Chinese Communist Party, he ranks third in the standing bureau, Politburo Standing Committee there. Uh, but he's also, you know, well aged. Uh, he's he's, he's all over the limit of the, you know, uh, age limit. So I don't think he could be elected as a chairman again, uh, coming this, uh, you know, Chinese Communist Communist Party Congress uh, in in October. Uh, so he's 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 scheduled to retire next month. So, uh, but, uh, but he's, he's still an influential figure when it comes to domestic politics in China. Right. Mm. Mr. Moon, Li Chenshu is slated to sit down with National Assembly Speaker Kim Jinpyo, as uh, Professor Chu has mentioned, and he is also scheduled to meet with President Chun seok gyeol here. That being said, what are your thoughts about the timing of Li Chenshu's trip here to South Korea and perhaps uh, its broader implications? Well, when Lee visited Vladivostok during the first week of September, he gave a speech emphasizing general themes like trade, energy, technology, and culture. He also told uh, Russian officials that his government wanted to deepen legislative cooperation on countering foreign influence and countering sanctions. So I suspect some of these subjects may come up, but there are also several issues that are unique to the China-South Korea relationship. Uh, China frequently uses both carrots and sticks in dealing with other countries. Um, China wants South Korean technology and semiconductors and other areas, so I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't offer some carrots in the form of economic opportunities in technology fields. At the same time, he may use some sticks in the form of threats designed to split South Korea from its allies. Uh, China has threatened and sanctioned South Korea in the past for cooperating with the United States on military and other matters. So he might very well return to the old playbook and extend that attitude to new initiatives like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and the CHIPS Alliance. But the big picture is that uh, China and Chinese leaders have not been traveling overseas, and this is a resumption of Chinese diplomacy overseas in the form of the number three leader coming to the Republic of Korea. Right, it is. And also, Professor Xu, yes. there is talk that Li Changshu and um, with his uh, meetings with officials here, it mm. might result in perhaps a possible summit between mm. President Yun seok gyeol and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Mm. What are the prospects of such a summit, do you think, perhaps uh, within the year? <laughs> uh, within a year. Okay, Sonny, you, you, you ask me every time I come up to this show. I do, I do. It's a frequent question. <laughs> yes, and uh, my, my answer hasn't changed yet. Uh, 
in, in, within a year, I don't think he'll, he'll come. Yeah. Uh, unless there's a breakthrough over Thad, which is uh, holding the summit back. So my take is uh, as long as, you know, this Thad issue remains as, a, as thorny as it is now, uh, there's no reason for Xi Jinping to come and visit South Korea. And like I said before, you know, once he, he, he touchdowns uh, in, in Seoul, then that means that issue has been resolved completely. So that, that there's a really you know, strong message you know, politically there. So, uh, uh, so it is really meaningful for Xi Jinping to land his feet on, on, on Seoul's soil. Right. Yeah. And speaking about uh, President Xi Jinping, Mr. Moon, his absence, his physical absence, that is, from the diplomatic scene over the past some 1,000 days, given the start of the pandemic, of course, do you suppose this absence has had an impact on perhaps Beijing's standing on the international arena? I think it really has. I think international travel gives national leaders an opportunity both to sp spread their message, but also to hear messages from foreign counterparts. In the two and a half years, since she last traveled overseas, a lot has happened. China's support for Ukraine, for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, has cost it friendships around the world. The results of China's vaccine diplomacy have been extremely disappointing. Um, in the meantime, the U.S. has repaired its relationships with a variety of allies, especially in Europe. Other countries are recovering from COVID while China is still in a lockdown. And international approval of China, according to various polls, is at all-time lows, including in the Republic of Korea. I think that China's sinking international images do, at least in part, to the inability of its leadership to comprehend how its actions and policies are perceived overseas. So getting out, seeing the world outside of China, and listening closely to what others have to say is very important for Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders. Right, of course it is. Professor Chu, mm. how in the meantime should mm. South Korea, I believe I've asked you this quite uh, yes. <laughs> frequently as well, how should S South Korea under President Yoon Suk-yeol seek yes. to balance its security ties with the U.S. and economic ties with China as yeah. these two powerhouses continue their standoff? Yes, uh, since then, you know, a lot of things have changed and uh, I don't think uh, we can really separate the two now. Uh, I think uh, we'd have to be really more clear on, you know, leaning towards one side over the other. Because with the, you know, you know start of uh, IPEF and, and Indo-Pacific strategy and CHIP4 and other things, right? Uh, they, they, they're, they're on the verge of materializing. And so therefore, Yoon song yeol government, since he declared that he's going to be more crop cooperative and strengthening the alliance relationship with the United States, uh, implying that he's going to take side with the United States. And I think that's the right choice because we have to understand where these two countries want to go and they're going to go on in their separate way. And uh, it's obvious that once they're going to take their own separate way, we have to make a choice. It, it, so the situation is different, different from the past. So therefore, I think Yoon suk yeol government, by choosing the United States, uh, and if it is the case, then uh, we have to understand the intent and the purposes of the United States strategy here, and that is to manage, uh, if not control, uh, the China. And, and I think by, by doing that, uh, we can also share the you know, profits and uh, uh, privileges of the United States-led initiatives here. And on the bilateral level, however, uh, we would have to also, by utilizing these, uh, you know, U.S.-led initiatives, uh, we should apply that in our relationship with China and try to manage China's uh, 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 some coercive measures uh, that, that we put against us. Right. Yeah. Mr. Timmit, I understand this next question may be quite tough, if not sen sensitive, of course. We're keeping in mind Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What are the chances, do you suppose, of a similar scenario here in Asia, especially given China's stance on uh, Taiwan? I, I think a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is very unlikely um, in the near term because Xi Jinping's priority is getting reelected at the upcoming party congress with nothing getting in the way. Over the longer term, I think the likelihood increases. Uh, results depend on the type of attack that's being launched. 
a quarantine designed to get Taiwan to just surrender peremptorily would have a different impact than a full-scale invasion, which would require troops to cross the Taiwan Straits. But the cost in any event would be extremely high. We know Taiwan's citizens will not accept Chinese rule willingly. There could be a tremendous loss of life. There will be enormous economic disruption, not just in the region, but perhaps globally. Military conflict could continue indefinitely. And China's relationship with the world and the leading nations of the world would never be the same ever again. Um, and what China's invasion, like the Russian invasion, sour? Can a China that has not fought a war in more than 40 years be sure an attack in Taiwan would go well? I, I think Xi Jinping will be wise enough to restrain the impulse to launch an invasion, and that, frankly, the biggest risk of a conflict is an unintentional military accident that escalates too quickly for leaders to control it. Right. Hopefully he's listening to you as well, Mr. Moon. Thank you so much for your words. They're reassuring nonetheless, of course. Thank you very much for your time and your thoughts, Mr. Moon. And Professor Ju here in the studio, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.